what a what? Yeah. Sorry. I have to say I got it. Okay. Uh, who was you know one of the the early uh, uh, young educators there? He is now a Montessori teacher uh, for MPS at Fernwood, and he's the liaison with the UEC Menominee Valley branch. You know, so he's <laughs> he's still very much involved. And my wife Sonia and I have been a long time supporters of the UEC. We do we have a, a lot of respect and you know, kind of reverence for the for the the mission of bringing nature to the city. Uh, so I know this, the series is you know, backyards, and uh, what I thought I'd do today uh, is talk about Milwaukee's park history, uh, because we are lucky in having most of us uh, parks, if not in our backyards, uh, within walking distance, and that is absolutely something a debt we owe uh, to our ancestors, and I want to tell that story. So I'm going to share a screen. Yeah. Oh, Maggie has to let me know. Let me in. I just made you co-host, I think. Okay. Right. Here I am sharing the screen. And here we are. And we will. Okay, you're admitting, Maggie? People will kind of come in? Yes. Yep. Okay. Slideshow. Play from start. Okay, so you can all see this. This is a, a view of uh, Seminary Woods in uh, southeastern Milwaukee County. And the, the first point I'd make is that at one time, all of Milwaukee was one big park. You think about the species that we try to preserve today or restore today, that was the whole story in Milwaukee, you know, during native times and all the time since the, the glacier left about 10,000 years ago. And what those communities were, uh, so I'm sure most of you know the ecological history in some basic uh, fashion, is Messick Hardwoods uh, was most of Milwaukee County, like this maple basswood forest here in uh, Seminary Woods. Uh, we also had a whole lot of wetland and much, much of town, Menominee Valley, Third Ward, Walker's Point, uh, pieces of Bayview were underwater. This is, <laughs> this is the uh, Horicon Marsh, but this is what the Menominee Valley might have looked like 175 or 200 years ago. Uh, and a lot of, uh, an awful lot of central Milwaukee is built on landfill. And we had just a little smidgen of prairie uh, out in the southwestern portion of Milwaukee County or in, in Franklin. So you have, you know, these uh, plant communities and the, the landscape began to change uh, radically and rapidly as soon as the first urban settlers arrived, which is back in the 1830s. You know, 1835 was the first public land sale here. And year by year, acre by acre, they cut down the trees, they filled in the wetlands, and they plot up the prairies. And so in some ways, the history of Milwaukee or of any city is you can describe it as a progressive destruction of native habitats and their replaced introduced species, including us. So it's self-evident that cities and wilderness are uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, it's, it's in our nature uh, to mold the landscape to, to our, uh, our needs. And that was not just a European, that was true of the natives as well. Uh, they cleared woodlands for corn. They crisscrossed the Milwaukee area with trails. Uh, Green, Bay Green Bay Avenue, the Green Bay Trail, that was worn two to three feet deep uh, in some places. And they used fire uh, to keep the land open. And there are some naturalists who will tell you that the, the major influence on the landscape in the Milwaukee area of Wisconsin since native times is fire suppression. You know, that kept down all the vegetation that uh, is so, so abundant today. But European change was of a different order of magnitude. The old communities were not so much altered as erased. And in their place, you came, you came wheat fields and pastures and block after block of human habitations. Uh, but even as that landscape was tamed and denatured, uh, there was a persistent hunger on the part of the, the settlers, wherever they came from, uh, for contact with nature. And they felt that contact, uh, certainly from their original homes. And even though the nature here was altered, it was nature nonetheless, and they wanted contact with it. So this was not considered a public responsibility. It's hard to imagine, but the only public green spaces in Milwaukee in the early decades were postage stamps given by public spirited citizens. Uh, and they persist today. This is Cathedral Square, uh, still there. Used to be called Cordell Square, 
uh, Walker Square, Zeta Union Square, and Clark Square, uh, as the names imply, none was larger than a single square block. So these were just little you know, kind of uh, uh, micro micro habitats in the heart of town. The only exception to uh, that pattern was Seventh Ward Park, which is today uh, Juno Park. You can see the the statue of Juno uh, still there up in the upper left hand corner. And this was a holdover from the days in the 1840s when the east and west sides came to blows over the issue of, of bridges. Uh, the bridge war fought back in 1845 was uh, one of our uh, sort of our, our foundational stories. And then he incorporated back in 1846 after ending that war, but the wars retained great power uh, to tax their residents and spend their own money. The seventh ward was Yankee Hill and the area on the east side of downtown. It was by far the most affluent section of town. So accordingly, you know, they, they tax themselves to build a park and down the bluff of what's now Juno Park. And I'm not sure if it's it's uh, unfortunate or some some ways encouraging. Look at all the litter here. You know, our, our ancestors were not necessarily as uh, good housekeepers as we might think of them as having been. So much of the rest of Milwaukee remained in a state of nature, but the Seventh Ward Park, that was our contact with green space. And look at, look at the hats here. This is uh, around 19, 1905 or so. That's the Northwestern Railroad Depot, uh, center of the picture. And what I would underline here is look at the lakefront. Now you're looking at the area on the left-hand side there that is now the Art Museum, the War Memorial Center, uh, Discovery World. It was all in, on landfill. So what the, at the foot of the bluff here, what was along the actual lakeshore was a, was a railroad track. So you have Northwestern Railroad Depot uh, being fed by these lines coming in from the north. And what that did was it effectively blocked Milwaukee's access to its most important natural resource, you know, crossing those tracks, which were very busy. Like, uh, your life into risk your own life. And it was uh, not easy to traverse as well. So uh, the park itself was nice, but the margin with the lakefront was uh, pretty much non-existent. So much of the rest of Milwaukee remained uh, in the area kind of surrounding the central business district uh, in a state of nature. And that was not considered a condition to preserve, but a problem to solve. As a great quote from Christian Wall, uh, whom you'll meet shortly back in 1894, uh, he said, there was a dense tamarack swamp a little south of Chestnut Street, which is Juno Avenue. And I fail on Prospect Avenue, a block or two north of my present residence, which is uh, north of Yankee Hill a bit. As people then thought we had parks with a vengeance, for to a man who has to raise corn and pork to feed his family, a tree is looked upon as a mortal enemy, whom to subdue means the hardest kind of labor. So rather a different take on green space than we are accustomed to today. Uh, so that need for green space intensified as more and more of the wilderness was uh, domesticated. And where public will was lacking, private enterprise stepped in. The 19th century landscape of Milwaukee was dotted with picnic groves and pleasure spots that were just thronged on summer weekends, as, as we're experiencing now. And they reflected the European tradition of what was called the Continental Sunday. While God-fearing Yankees uh, went to church twice, sometimes three times on Sunday, the Germans, who are the majority ethnic group in Milwaukee, they were out in the fresh air with their, with their families. And more often than not, they were enjoying that fresh air in beer gardens. Uh, they were plentiful. And the most popular were run by breweries. The, the Yankees were just horrified you know, by the, the practice of drinking beer on Sunday, even though a lot of these folks went to church and then went to the beer garden. Uh, but the Yankee Protestants, uh, they would describe this, dismiss these as Sunday orgies or Sabbath profanation which did not deter the Germans in, in any way at all. So Pabst had two uh, beer gardens. One was in town, it was on uh, Third and Garfield, King and Garfield now, uh, an old shooting park. And then it became a beer garden and an amusement park. Uh, had a, uh, an attraction there called Katzenyammer's Castle, which uh, kind of a fun house. Uh, this became Garfield Park later on and is now Rose Park. And Pabst also had a, a country resort uh, out on, in Whitefish Bay. This is the Whitefish Bay Resort uh, around Henry Clay. 
And their specialty was planked whitefish dinners uh, that were that featured whitefish caught in Whitefish Bay. So it was a, a local resource. And some, I'm not sure you through the panel there, but there's there's a, a Ferris wheel on the right side of this, this photograph. They came up by the turnpike along what's now Lake Drive, and you could also come out on a little steamer called the Bloomer Girl, uh, which would go from the downtown dock and uh, dock at the, the foot of the bluff there on these very elaborate switchback trails that would lead the uh, the patrons from the lakeshore up to up to the beer garden. So they developed a thirst you know, just walking up that hill. And you have Schlitz Park, which was probably the busiest in Milwaukee, it's around uh, around Ethan Brown, uh, the Royal Middle School is. Uh, if you can you can picture that, uh, Halyard Park, that area. And the features here were a 5,000 seat amphitheater uh, shown here, uh, an observation tower, uh, some of the city's first electric lights, and entertainment that ranged over the years from light opera to diving horses. So they actually, <laughs> somehow they get a, a horse up on a platform and it, it the, was trained you know, to jump into a, a pool of water. Uh, this became Lapham Park, uh, then Carver Park, and is now Stapleton Park. So. You also have another brewery beer garden. Uh, Miller's is out on the west side. Uh, Blatt's had a beer garden on the Milwaukee River at what's now Pleasant Valley Park, kind of right to north, north of Locust uh, a little bit. And this is a, a really interesting period in Milwaukee's history. Back in those years when you have a hot, hot spell, uh, there was no air conditioning. Uh, there weren't, weren't fans for a long time because there was no electricity. So there was just a desperate need during a time when our ancestors had six day work weeks for on their one day off, you know, some respite from the heat. So the Lake Michigan uh, beaches, uh, when they finally became accessible, uh, were, were lake was too rough, it was too cold. So it was not something that people would, would have flocked to in any case. The Milwaukee River above the North Avenue Dam uh, was by contrast, uh, warm, protected and easily accessible to uh, tens of thousands of Milwaukee residents. So you have this, this stretch for another call the Milwaukee River Greenway uh, from the North Avenue Dam all the way up to Capitol Drive that served Milwaukeeans as kind of an in-town up north. You had canoes, canoe clubs. There were three swimming schools uh, just above the dam in the deep water. And see how they, <laughs> they taught these kids to swim for the harness, harness around them and dangle them like bait, you know, giving them enough support so they could get their strokes down before they were finally left to swim on their own. There were also public beaches uh, farther north. This was the one at Gordon Park and the concrete foundations are still there on the west bank of the Milwaukee River just across from the UEC. And so from North Avenue to Capitol Drive, you have all these attractions, amusement parks, beer gardens, and a water slide called Shoot the Shoots. <laughs> this is a cool photograph. This is on the, the east bank of the Milwaukee River, uh, just south of the North Avenue Bridge. And what this was is a water toboggan. You know, you sort of they splash across the river and they'd be winched back up. And I'm not sure why these did not persist, not why they did not endure, but they call these water bicycles. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a cool way to enjoy uh, the Milwaukee River or or any uh, body of flat water. So that these guys are out there with their straw boaters and their ties on you know, in, their, in their Sunday best. So by the mid 1870s, you could take a, a steam launch from the Wisconsin Avenue Bridge up to the Arnold Dam and then train to one of these steamers that were essentially water taxis. And they would drop you off anywhere along the upper river uh, at all those resorts for a 15 cent fare, uh, which is about three bucks today which is certainly something I'd, I'd pay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not nostalgic, but uh, if there were a place I could be transported to uh, just, just for a day, it would be the, the upper Milwaukee River uh, during, the, during the summer months. There were also a number of wealthy German families who built summer homes out on the east bank, or rather west bank of the Milwaukee. This is the Kern family's home, which later became Kern Park. And the families, the, the Pulikers, the Meinekees, the Elines, all had homes up in what a little settlement called Humboldt, uh, south of Capitol Drive, between roughly Locust and Capitol. And they would bring their kids out there uh, for this, this idyllic summer experience and keep them out there all summer. 
and come back when school started, never moving beyond Capitol Drive. And so this really was a kind of uh, in-town country. The old Blatt's Beer Garden is now Pleasant Valley Park. So even the, the Upper River and all the beer gardens around town, the other picnic groves, uh, as plentiful as they were, as pleasant as they were, they could not satisfy the public's hunger for green space. So how hungry were they? Yeah, this is Forest Home Cemetery, which was opened back in 1850. And consider that back in 1888, nearly 8,000 people spent their summer Sundays at Forest Home Cemetery. They were not there to lay flowers in the graves of their loved ones. Uh, what drew them was some of the most painstakingly tended green space, probably in Wisconsin, an ensemble of native trees, floral plantings, ponds, fountains, carriage paths, and some monumental examples of the, the stone carver's art. This is a nice place. It was and it is, but 8,000 people in a cemetery on a Sunday proved that the public officials had been asleep at the switch. They were not meeting what was an increasingly desperate need uh, for contact with public, for the public contact with green space. And this is a, a figure that seems unbelievable. In 1889, uh, Milwaukee's parks, and that is all of them, covered a grand total of 125 acres compared to 15,000 today. 125 acres is just about the size of Estabrook Park uh, today. So really there, there was a, a, a paucity of green space. Official Milwaukee finally woke to its responsibilities. And in 1889, when you have that sort of low point way behind the, the, the American urban curve, the city, and it was not yet the county, uh, established a park commission and try to make up for lost time. The commission's first president was this guy, uh, Christian Wall, who was a German immigrant uh, who came to Milwaukee, uh, moved to Chicago, became a glue manufacturer, made his fortune there, and then came back to Milwaukee in retirement and became kind of an upper class Johnny Appleseed. Uh, so he, he spearheaded the effort uh, to green Milwaukee. And he said the commissioners especially endeavored to select such property as had not yet been entirely denuded of timber by the ruthless acts of speedy Western civilization. So what they did was within a year or two, uh, they had purchased six tracks for parkland. They were kind of make, making uh, large statements. And they included a uh, lake. And here you have before trees, this was, this was Lake Park. Uh, Lake Park, Riverside, Washington, Mitchell, Kosciuszko, and Humboldt. So you've got uh, UEC, you know, Riverside, and, and, and Washington. Those were uh, two of the first six uh, parcels in what became a, a, fa a fabulous system. And a planner who was hired for three of the parks, which are Washington, Lake, and Riverside, was Frederick Law Olmsted, whose 200th anniversary uh, of his birth we celebrate this year. But it was Wall who was kind of the, the guy who was on the ground executing Olmsted's plans. This is a ravine in Lake Park. And he lived nearby in a mansion nearby Lake Park and supervised. He was a hands-on uh, park official. And Cruz working under his direction, uh, even though he was a, a lay person, not an employee, they planted by his rough estimate uh, thousands of forest and nursery trees and tens of thousands of shrubs. And some of those trees uh, were towering oaks and elms, so specimen trees uh, transported from the country. So they would go out into the boonies and find specimen trees and take them to Lake Park by sled during the winter months and place them in holes pre-dug. And after each one of those giants was safely placed in the ground, Wall celebrated by raising a glass of champagne, which I think is an, an interesting practice. Uh, so there are friends groups supporting the parks today, and he was the, the first and one of the finest friends Milwaukee's parks ever had. So Milwaukee turned a corner, uh, but all was not well. Those first six purchases totaled $800,000, which was a huge sum uh, back in the 18, 1890s. And city officials, they were not about to authorize spending for more parks or to even develop the green space that they had. So what happened was you have the position of uh, stasis, you know, pretty much passive holding of these, these great parcels. It took 10 or 20 years 
before they were finally uh, saved and spent enough money to make these parks and not just passively held green space. But the job was eventually done and you have improvements ranging from a glass conservatory and a predecessor of the domes in Mitchell Park. And these were all around country. Garfield Park in Chicago uh, still has one. Uh, so this was a showcase for, for floral plantings. And you have a uh, number of others, uh, the golf course on Lake Park, other amenities that were you know, part of uh, what became the county system. Milwaukee County, in the meantime, was finally waking up on its own. In 1907, the County Park Commission was established to acquire and develop green space beyond the city's borders. This was a time of incredible ferment in Milwaukee's political history. Uh, after years of inefficiency and outright corruption, a reform movement gathered speed, and at its forefront were the socialists. And this man, Emil Seidel, a former pattern maker by trade, became Milwaukee's first socialist mayor uh, in 1910, and he was kind of in the vanguard of a socialist sweep. And the first of Milwaukee's three socialist mayors, followed by uh, Dan Hone and Frank Seidler. And what they stood for in the decades uh, that they were a major influence on Milwaukee government was what they referred to as public enterprise, you know, capital P, capital E. So public enterprise meant spending public funds for the public good on public works, public schools, public libraries, public housing, and public parks. You know, that was a major plank in the socialist platform. So Milwaukee's parks, the city's park development resumed its earlier speed and there was new momentum on the county side. And the driver here was this man, Charles B. Whitnell, who's one of my favorite Milwaukeeans. He was the dominant figure on land use planning in Milwaukee uh, for both the city and the county. You know, he was secretary of both the commissions. And certainly uh, for those about 40 years from the early 1900s until the, the 1940s. Uh, he, was, he was the guy, uh, a landscape uh, gardener by profession, uh, a planner by instinct, and a, a socialist by con conviction. And he was the godfather of the park system as we know it today. Uh, in 1923, he released his master plan. And basically his kind of guiding principle was hanging Milwaukee's parks on a trellis of waterways. He thought that the, the watershed was the uh, fundamental unit in the planning of uh, not just the, the park system, but uh, any, any urban area. So you see, you know, uh, you can see the Milwaukee River, Little Menominee, Big Menominee, uh, KK route. Uh, so uh, you have 84 miles of parked driveways. And I think there's a comedian Gallagher. Gallagher says, why do we park in driveways and drive in parkways? <laughs> so wouldn't all refer to these as, as park driveways. And the idea was to uh, you know, have these corridors of green space and as strategic nodes along the parkways, you'd have major parks. And if you do an overlay of this 1923 master plan with today Milwaukee County's park system, it's really pretty close. It's kind of uncannily close. So you have along these waterways, you have a necklace of parks along the, the lakefront. This is Bradford Beach uh, in an earlier time, obviously. And in other Great Lakes cities, uh, you have the lake fronts are, are given up to high end housing or high volume uh, highways. In Milwaukee, most of our public, most of our lakefront is in the public domain. Uh, we've done a wonderful job of preserving our lakefront and don't pat ourselves in the back enough uh, for what it already gets Bob, Bob and thanks to our ancestors for preserving that for, for the present day. So you also have uh, rivers, you, know, you have the, this necklace of rivers, river parks, you know, going up from uh, above North Avenue, uh, all the way past Capitol Drive into, almost into Ozaukee County. Uh, this is Estabrook Park. There's actually a beach along the Milwaukee River, uh, as well as Brown Deer, Clatch, Lincoln, Kern, Riverside, and Gordon. Along the Menominee, another river, you have uh, the Curry, Hoyt, Jacobus, Stoin, and Mitchell Parks. And UEC certainly is a stone's throw. Along the KK, uh, you have Jackson Park, shown here, uh, Pulaski and, and Barron Parks. This is near where I grew up, around 34th and Forest Home. 
And I can recall crabbing with my uncle in this lagoon, which is still very much there. And along the route, a river, you have Greenfield Park and the biggest of them all, which is Whitnell Park, which is, is named appropriately, uh, the largest park in Milwaukee County, uh, named appropriately for uh, Charles B. Whitnell, who was the, the founder of the system. In every case, these parks are linked by parkways that offer some of the, the finest hiking and urban biking in the country. Uh, they did not materialize overnight. Uh, Milwaukee County went to work on the plan. The city kept on working. But in 1929, just six years after Whitnell uh, finished his drawings, the stock market crashed. And that ushered in a period of uh, just economic hardship for the people of Milwaukee. And ironically, uh, it meant a great, great leap forward for the parks. The silver lining in the Depression was this alphabet soup of New Deal work relief programs, the CCC, WPA, NIRA, and a variety of others. The goal was to put as many people to work as possible, often at manual labor. And what is more manual than developing parks? So the socialists had filled shelves with detailed plans for Milwaukee development and city as well. Let's talk about the, the consolidation here. Uh, but they put 4,000 workers on the job on two days' notice when the money became available back in 1933. So by the time the Depression eased, uh, Milwaukee's park development was 10 to 15 years ahead of schedule. And a number of parks, uh, you can see here, are almost literally hand-carved. Land acquired for back taxes during the Depression uh, was also uh, set aside for park use, especially in failed subdivisions on the northwest side. And by 1936, those tax land parcels totaled 4,300 acres. Welcome additions to what became a, a growing park system. As governmental efficiency became a watchword during the Depression, people trying to save money, it became obvious that the city and the county parks were, were they were redundant. So the city owned land outside its limits, and the county had land inside the city. So it made sense to consolidate them, which voters approved by a three to one margin. And on the first day of January 1937, the city system was folded into the park system, and it's been the parks, county park system uh, ever since. No sooner had the Depression ended than World War II began, and the county parks were invaluable as oases of tranquility during a, a very trying time. And when peacetime returned and there was a housing crisis, uh, recall nobody built anything between 1930 and 1945. So as the guys came back from the war and began to have families, uh, baby boomers like me come into the world, uh, you have just a, a critical housing shortage. And one short-term solution was prefabricated houses put in Milwaukee County's parks. This is Wilson on the south side. Uh, others had trailers, temporary homes, uh, including some built by the Harness Figure Corporation. And they were placed in Lapham Park, Lincoln Park, Wilson Park, McCarty Park, and seven others around the county. And these were these were expedients, the temporary expedients. And a lot of these were torn down when the crisis passed and the market kind of kept up. Uh, the supply kept up with demand or caught up with demand. Uh, but some of these became cottages, you know, out of places like Wind Lake and Wabasi in the southwest of Milwaukee. <coughs> so you have, finally, in the 1950s, the park system is kind of caught up and has room to breathe and begins to resume uh, its expansion. Aggressive acquisition uh, during the post-war years, uh, system to the present of 15,000 acres, and some five-star attractions emerged as part of that system. For anybody who grew up in Milwaukee after the war, uh, you had a guest from out of town or planning a Sunday outing with your family. Where'd you go? You went to the Mitchell Park Domes, you went to the Burner Botanical Gardens, uh, you went to the County Zoo. These were show places, uh, sources of civic pride and touchstones of civic identity. And to fast forward, and you're all aware of current conditions in the, the county park system, there has been uh, a massive uh, disinvestment in the parks. And what's been going on here is you know, revenue sharing, uh, uh, not just you know, shrinks, but uh, falls behind. 
and you have other uh, services, social services, correctional services, the courts, those are all mandated by the state. Parks are not. They are considered discretionary. I, I, I believe firmly that they are not discretionary. They are essential. But the result of you know, those uh, public policy decisions or lack of decisions has been just uh, the decaying of parks. This is a favorite place in Whitnell Park. Uh, it's closed and the, the dam put put together painstakingly by the CCC uh, has fallen into disrepair and the, the path around this, this lagoon has, uh, is closed. It's a favorite place for my family to walk in years past and now it's virtually impassable. So you have uh, roughly $300 million in deferred maintenance. You know, it would take that much and perhaps more to bring the system back up to code. So this is a system in crisis. The news is not entirely bad. Uh, on the biking front, there have been some additions uh, on the lakefront, the southwest side up in Brown Deer. Uh, but the system as a whole is certainly in trouble. In 2008, a majority of Milwaukee County residents uh, said yes to a one cent increase in the sales tax to fund parks and transit. Uh, Governor Jim Doyle and the state legislature, they declined to act on that proposal. And it's even less likely to pass uh, under the current uh, political situation in Madison. So we are at a stalemate and time takes its toll. The seasons take their toll year after year after year. I suspect I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, certainly with the UEC audience, but our generation could blow it. We could lose the legacy that has been under development for well over a century in Milwaukee. Unless we develop a new surge of political will uh, and find new sources of cash, the park system as we know it will wither into oblivion. In time, the green spaces we cherish today will devolve from untended to unloved and finally to unsafe, uh, becoming corridors of crime instead of corridors of calm. That, I believe, and I'm sure you agree, would be a tragedy of the highest order. Our parks, I firmly believe, are the broadest and most visible embodiment of our commonwealth. They frame the urban picture for all of us. They provide relief from the insistent pressures of civilization. They open vistas, literally, to worlds beyond the human, and they hint at higher values. Parks are our community's front yards, and letting them deteriorate indicates that the owners are either absent or sick. But in Milwaukee, public parks are something even more. We view our parks with an especially strong sense of ownership. Each park, each public green space is a classic declaration of democracy, a strong statement that beauty spots belong to all of us. That is a statement that we need to continue to make for our own welfare and the welfare of all the generations still to come.